Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really lovely to see you. And um, my name is Clive, and we're welcoming not just uh, all of you in person here at Duncan Road Church, uh, but others who might be joining us on stream. So it's really great to be together. And I have to say that, well, it must be a year or more since last we were here, and I think there's a higher proportion of younger people and children than there was last time. And it's lovely to see uh, all of the children here this morning. But we're all equally welcome. And uh, we're gathered in the name of the Lord Jesus to worship and to honor him, aren't we? You can nod or say yes if you like. And uh, we're going to start by singing a song together. Uh, You're the word of God the Father from before the world began. So let's uh, stand and sing this song together. Well done. Please sit down. Uh, Our Bible reading today is in the book of Romans, the letter of Romans in the New Testament of the Bible. Do we put it up on screen? Yes, we do. So uh, you can follow it on screen. Um, I hope mine's the same translation. It probably is. Romans chapter 3, and we're going to read the first 20 verses. What advantage then is there there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Would their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. 
as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I am using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Their condemnation is just. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Well, that's a really hard-hitting Uh, passage from the Bible, isn't it, right at the beginning of our service? But we're going to be thinking about that later, and uh, we'll pray that God will really help us as we seek to understand what his word is saying. Uh, Now, David is going to lead us in our prayer this morning, so I'm going to hand over to David now. So as uh, many of you would have heard, um, we had the very sad news this week um, that Alistair passed away. Um, So we're going to focus our prayer time today on on, uh, Alistair's family. Um, So let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you that we can meet here today. Lord, we meet here today, many of us with, with heavy hearts. Because although we're we're studying a book today written by Paul, and Paul said those words, you know, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? We admit that when we lose a loved one, a friend, a husband, a father, a grandfather, that we feel that sting. But Lord, we want to thank you for, for Alistair's life. Uh, Many of us knew him for a long time, some of us just for a shorter time, but all of us were blessed by knowing that man. We we thank you for Alistair's service as as an elder and as a leader in this church. We thank you for his, his example. We thank you for just his godly character as as a father, as a husband as a grandfather. Help us to follow his example. Lord, we we pray for Alistair's family today. They must be feeling his loss greatly and we, we pray that you would comfort them as they mourn. Lord, we know that it is right to mourn. Death is an enemy. And Lord, we pray that you would bring comfort 
to David, to Rosie, to Alistair, to, to Alison, to the rest of the family, Lord, at this time. Help us to give thanks for his life. His long life, Lord, that you, you blessed him with and you blessed us with uh, who, who knew him. But most of all, Lord, thank you that even in the sadness, we can have hope. We know that what Paul said, that death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? We can truly say that because we know that people like Alistair who put their faith in you, when they die, they are with you. Lord, thank you that we know that if we have put our faith in you, we can meet Alistair again. So Lord, we, we thank you for the life of Alistair and we pray for his family and pray for ourselves as we mourn the loss of a friend, a husband, a father, a grandfather. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I um, step down, I'm going to ask uh, Paul to come up, actually. Um, Paul, wherever he, wherever he is. Oh, he's at the back. There we go. Whilst Paul's coming up, um, uh, those of you who were here last week and who've been involved in members' meetings and stuff over the last year or so know that we've been thinking a lot about deacons. Um, deacons is a is a, a role that we're taught about in the New Testament. It's about sort of formalizing uh, the practical service within the church, leadership of practical service within the church. Um, and over the past couple of months, we've been talking about the uh, property maintenance deacon. That's the one we've been focusing on to start with. Uh, and just to recap, the, the focus of this role is that we want to make sure that we have a place to meet to worship God. It's not about just fixing pipes and, and sorting out floors for the sake of it. It's, it's to allow us to have a place where we, the people of God, can meet to worship God. That's, that's what uh, property maintenance is about. It may not seem sexy and uh, exciting on the surface, but it is a way of serving God and serving his people. And as the leadership of, of Duncan Road Church, we, we want to hold up practical service and say, actually, this is a valuable service. We know that we recognize that we have diverse gifts within this church, and we want to recognize those, and we want to do them well. And maintaining the building and making sure we have a, a place to meet um, and, and, and serve God is really, really important. So we focused on that um, role first. And those of you who were here last week heard uh, Gordon, uh, I'm sure you, you heard Gordon announce that um, we intend to appoint uh, Paul as this deacon. And this is the week, Paul, even though Paul was talking to me before. He said, well, I've been doing this for the last, the last 30 years. <laughs> so we're, we're now kind of putting a name on it. So Paul's job is um, going to be to lead this area of service within the church, but also to bring along people with him to do that. It's not a one-man job. So do not be expecting Paul to be doing all the work. I'm afraid he's going to be coming to you and asking you to help him, all right? Uh, it's <laughs> but there's a nod. Um, but uh, we want to just, as a church leadership, we want to recognize um, this role. We want to recognize Paul in this role. Um, Paul's uh, currently on the eldership. Um, we're going to be going through a bit of a transition period where Paul is going to be stepping back from eldership at the end of this year. So we'll have a sort of a, 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 a crossover period. But at the end of this year, Paul will be 100% our property maintenance deacon. But at the moment, he's going to balance both roles for the next six months or so. Thank, so thank you, Paul. Um, but with everything we do as a church leadership and as a church, we need to commit it to God in prayer. Whether it's the preaching up the front, whether it's the service out there, or whether it's service in the building. It doesn't matter what it is, we need to commit it to God. Because unless God builds the house, the laborers work in vain. Um, so I'm going to pray for Paul and pray for the work that Paul and his team are going to be doing over the coming months and years. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you give your church diverse gifts and abilities. Lord, thank you that we can't, all of us, do everything. No, no one of us can do all the jobs that are necessary in the church to keep it, keep it going, keep it thriving. Thank you that it requires all of us chipping in and, and providing our abilities, our talents, our gifts, our spiritual gifts that you give us. Lord, thank you for blessing people like Paul with, with practical service gifts. And we recognize that he and many others have been doing this for, for decades. And it is what keeps this church running. It's what enables us to stand here today 
and worship you. It's what has put a roof over our head. It's what has meant that the water is flowing so we can have tea and coffee after the service. All those good things that enable fellowship, enable worship, enable evangelism are all enabled by these practical gifts, faithful people using those practical gifts. Lord, we, we thank you for giving Paul this gift and we, we commit him and those that he's going to be working with over the coming months and years to you. Lord, we, we commit this area of our ministry, practical service in, in keeping this building running so that we can have somewhere to worship, somewhere to meet. We commit that to you. Lord, as, as church leaders, we have many plans and ideas, but we recognize that you are the one who, who makes them work. You are the one who gives growth. So Lord, we commit Paul to you. And we pray that you'd give him wisdom, you'd give him tax, you'd give him the ability to, to, to see problems before they happen, to meet needs, to, to work alongside people, as he has been doing for many years. Help him to continue to do that. I pray for the, the, that people would come alongside Paul and work with him, uh, that this would be a team effort, Lord. We commit this work and we commit the work of, of Paul as a deacon to you. Amen. Amen. Well, boys and girls, especially, I asked Paul how old were the boys and girls, and he said, well, anything from three to 93. So that gave me a really good clue. <laughs> but we have got someone who's about that age at the upper um, upper end, and I don't think there's anyone under three. Possibly not. So you're all included in this. Um, right then, what's your favourite subject at school? What do you really like doing? Go on then. Science? Dance. Wow, you've got a whole list there. How about somebody else? Any favourite things you like doing at school? Mass. Mass. Oh, I'm so glad. I wanted someone who was going to say mass. Any other favourite subjects? Right. Well, you've all got something, haven't you, at school that you like? Or I hope you. I hope you do anyway. Now, oh look, it's a couple more. Okay. What do you? What's your favourite? Sorry? Soft play. Jobs play. Soft, soft. soft play. Sorry. I'll, I'll blame it on that, but actually it's my hearing. Math and English. Maths and English. I was pretty good at English, but my maths teacher wrote me off, and I discovered later in life I was fairly numerate, really. I'm just not very good at mathematics. Now then, Jesus uh, once was challenged by one of his followers called Peter as to how many times you should forgive somebody. So does anyone know what, what was suggested to Jesus might be the number of times that you should forgive someone? Was it one, two? Uh, stop me when I get there. Three, four, five, six. Do you know? Oh, you're so close. What comes after six? Seven. And Peter said... Oh, is it seven times? And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. Now then, those of you who are good at maths, what is 70 times seven? 490, 490. Now, I once heard somebody say, ah, Jesus didn't mean literally 490. I don't think he did. He said, why don't you take 70 to the power of seven. Now, how have the older children have done that in maths? You know, something to the power of something. Oh, there are a couple of mathematicians here. Right, what do you think it is? Well, what is something to the power of? The number. Yeah. Itself, as many times as yeah. You got it on the nail. So, in other words, that would be 70 times 70. Yeah. 
How, what do you think 70 to the power of 7 equals then? Now, you must know the answer. Colin must know the answer to that one. No, I don't know an answer. I'd like to make a guess. <laughs> Go on, then. I reckon it's hundreds of billions. Mm, pretty good, pretty good. Of course, I calculated, didn't I? No, no, no one has an idea, do they? Uh, just for your information, it's 8 trillion... Uh, 235 billion, 430 million. Work that one out. That's how many atoms there are in your body, I expect. What a number. Um, now then, what, is, is anyone good at school at sport? Do you like, so I heard someone's good at dance. You'll be good for this, actually. You, li you like your rubbish. But you don't mind it. How about athletics? Any of you do athletics at school? Don't like the look of this, do you? <laughs> Whatever it is all this about. You like it, do you? Would you like to be a volunteer? Come on, Ruth. I need your help, Ruth, for this one. This is dead simple. I need two or three volunteers. And it's not hard, actually. I'm not going to get you to run around the block. Would you like the children? <laughs> well, possibly. Right then, this is a pretend high jump, okay? So you've got to stand there, and I think we'd better put it a bit lower, don't you? you I don't need you necessarily to go or run up, but do you reckon you could get over that one? Go on, then. Hooray, let's give him a clap. What about if I go slightly higher? Go on. Bit. <laughs> well done. What about if I'd have put it up there? Oh, look, we've got another volunteer. Can you jump as well? Or are you just uh, <laughs> sitting down? Well done. Thank you very much. Right. Now then, we're thinking very much today about what pleases God and how we can become Christians. And, it, you know, God is so holy and perfect. It's like the bar is set up there. Now, if you were entering the Olympics, what do you think is the qualifying jump. I, don't, I only know roughly. I think it's about six foot, and six or seven foot. If you can't jump that, you can't enter the Olympics. But just imagine if it were up there, well, no one could do a high jump over that. And if we were to be perfect and wonderful, well, we could absolutely be right for God. If we knew the answer to every good thing, or as Jesus said, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then, of course, we will be good enough for God. But thankfully, we don't have to rely upon ourselves. Who do we trust in in order that we might have our sin forgiven and have eternal life? Do any of the boys and girls know that? That's a difficult question, isn't it? I reckon you know it because every single week or most of the weeks you find out more and more about this person. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus. We have to trust in Jesus, don't we? And he can then bring us to the Father. Only through Jesus can we have our sin forgiven. That's a high standard. Um, if we didn't have him, we would never make it. Well done. You've done very well. And I hope you enjoy your uh, time together uh, a bit short, a bit later on. Right, we've got two songs. And uh, let's sing these two songs together. The first one is Man of Sorrows. And then we're going to sing Christ is Mine Forevermore, which I think is fairly new. So we're going to sing it again this morning. So we stand.
This next song was a new one that David introduced last week, so I'm hoping everyone can still remember it and, and sing along. Thought I'd play it again while it's still fresh in our minds. Wow, well done. I, uh, I've just learned a new one, so uh, maybe I can take that one away with me. That's really great. Um, I think it's time for the children to go to your group, isn't it? Well, you could have a great time. Look after your leaders. Let them come back in one piece. <laughs> Well, let's pray for them and pray for us as we come to God's Word. Father, it really is grand to see all of these youngsters coming together with us this morning. 
We thank you for each one and pray that you will do a wonderful work of grace in their lives. Give them their, these foundations that are so vital as they grow up that they can learn uh, to love and to serve you, to trust you fully. Help those who are working hard amongst them and may they have great joy in seeing you at work in their lives. And do speak to us here this morning, we pray. We know we totally depend upon you to bring your word alive in our hearts. We pray that you will speak to us and grant that when we finish, it will be with a clarity over what your word says that will help us both to know you for ourselves personally and eager to uh, tell others of the good news that you have entrusted to us. So be honored and glorified, we pray, in all that's done and said, in the name of our Savior, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I have the title this morning, Are We Really That Bad? And it sounded pretty bad, didn't it, when we read Romans chapter 3. And uh, someone suggested, I shan't say who, that this could be my shortest sermon ever. The answer is yes. Right, we can now go. No, we can't. We need to expound that a little bit and understand what God is saying to us through his word. Um, currently back in Poole, we're looking at in our home group at the book of Jeremiah. And that's a pretty tough uh, book to work through. It's full of lots of judgments and curses that God brings upon his people because of their rebellion and sin. And Jeremiah, poor Jeremiah, had to be the one to bring that message constantly to the kings, to the priests, from the leaders, to the ordinary people of how much they stood condemned in God's sight. So you can imagine, can't you, that he wasn't the most popular guy around. Uh, very often he was either belittled or argued with. Sometimes he was completely ignored. And other times he was beaten up, even thrown into a prison or a pit. Now, as a result of that, he had many tears, frustrations, depression. And he became known as the weeping prophet. Those of you who read the book will know. Now, can I say this morning that what we are looking at has a lot of bad news in it. Please don't shoot the messenger. I'm only here to bring God's word. Of course, if I don't bring it accurately or it needs some ex further explanation, then tackle me afterwards and challenge me by all means. But when it comes to the book of Romans, I think you could say that there is no fuller, clearer, presentation of the gospel which is the good news about Jesus Christ now we say that because it is the good news by the very fact we talk about good news it is implicit therefore there must be bad news isn't isn't there so if I come to you and say Derek I've got some good news for you you're going to say well this is obviously different to the last time you spoke to me because um, last time I had bad news or ordinary news, but this time I've got good news. But that's what b the book of Romans is about. That's what the gospel is. It's presenting good news because there is bad news without, says the Bible, a knowledge of Jesus Christ. For those who reject or ignore God in their lives, there is certainly bad news. That is very implicit. So, as I understand it now, you're picking up again in your series in Romans. So, you've already worked through, I guess, chapter 1 and chapter 2, and now you're back on series looking at chapter 3 onwards. And the introduction, really, of these first couple of chapters are quite key. So, uh, when it comes to those early chapters of Romans, the good news is the first thing that Paul talks about. 
But then in talking about the good news, almost immediately, Paul refers to the resurrection of Jesus. And he says those Old Testament prophets, all the things that they had to say, by and large, were all anticipating the Lord Jesus Christ. And now they found fulfillment in him who is the Messiah. And when you read through the book of Romans, constantly uh, Christ is at the forefront of this, of this book. It's comparing how we stand before him and how that we can come to know him as Lord and Savior by his death and also his resurrection. And says Paul in chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a power of God for the salvation of all who believe. I do hope that none of us are ashamed of that message. If we love the Lord, this is surely something which has transformed our lives and should give us the, the motive and the desire to share that with other people as well. But in contrast, in that early chapter of Romans, Paul's Paul says that God is angry. His wrath is being revealed against people who are godless and wicked. They suppress the truth about God. Uh, we have the evidence of God around us, don't we? The creation of the world, amongst many other things, the beauty, the glory, the order, the information, the fine detail. These are all pointing to who created this world and who orders it. God himself. But people suppress that truth because they don't want to know God. And as a result, says the Bible, people have become degraded, immoral, and sinful. And there are some very explicit words in that early chapter of um, Romans. So when it comes to chapter 2, well, that's all about how God judges the world. God, who is holy and righteous, who created us, rightly as sovereign, as creator, judges sin. And he will judge sin. And he judges a right. He will repay people according to what they've done. So there is a measure of um, things are measured according to God's holiness. And then the last chapter, or last part of chapter 2, um, Paul starts talking, as Paul wrote the uh, book of Romans uh, as inspired by God's Holy Spirit. Uh, he started talking about what it meant to be a Jew and what it meant to keep the law because that was the way in which the Jews were accepted by God by maintaining his law and not uh, going into idolatry and also the, the subject of circumcision. And that's the background now where we come to what we're thinking of this morning in chapter 3. When I read this chapter, and you would have read it probably many times as well, I can't help feeling that Paul is just like a lawyer in a, a court of law or a barrister. He's arguing his case. I mean, he's a very well-learned man. It's stated that probably he knew six languages. He could probably speak that number of languages. Highly educated, not only in the scriptures, but in the whole of life. And he's able to get hold of deep truths about God as God was revealing them to him and present them in a kind of a well-ordered and argued state. So he would set up an argument and say, what's this question? And then he would go about either answering that question or undermining even the basis of the question till eventually he presents to us this gospel of the Lord. So it's one of those um, books, and especially this chapter, where we need to engage, if you like, our mind. We need to think through uh, the issues that um, are there before us. Now, I've tried to select, if you like, the main questions that the Apostle Paul raises, and then he explains the answers, sometimes even to undermine the nature of the question itself. And the first one is this. 
Is there an advantage in being a Jew? Remember that he's first and foremost writing to Jews as well as to Gentiles, people like ourselves. At least if you're a Jewish person, um, please introduce yourself afterwards. Uh, most of us here, if not all of us, will be Gentiles, non-Jews. But he says, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? And then what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way, he says. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Now, they were a very privileged people, weren't they, the Jews? They were selected by God from amongst the people. Uh, Abraham initially received the promises and the covenants from God. His son Isaac uh, had the same. And then Jacob, who was renamed Israel received those and God formed the nation of Israel. And you'll remember how he led them out of bondage in Egypt, across the Red Sea, through the wilderness, 40 years, and eventually to the promised land. And during that time, God gave them the law, so they had a structure in their society, both for serving God and a well-ordered basis for life. He established the worship, and that included uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness that became the temple um, and the priesthood. And if you were to look at the Jewish nation and then compare them with the nations around them, you really would see the order which was in place in society. And when they were truly following the Lord, they really stood apart in the world in their religious practice as well as in the society that they had. But alas, the people of God did not keep faithful to him rather than worship him alone, which was their part of the covenant. They forsook, they forsook him for idols. Again, thinking about um, Jeremiah, that's been very much upon my own mind. Uh, one of the things that God compared uh, the people of his people then and what it was like with the nations uh, apart from Israel was this. God said, well, they worship these idols and incidentally, that would even include sacrificing children. So this was an evil that was all around the nation. But at least they kept faithful to their gods. But I am the true and living God and you don't keep faithful to me. Instead, you follow their practices. And that was the irony, really, of the Jewish people at that time. So Paul says, look, there is an advantage in being a Jew in one sense. But at the end of that argument, there's a real contrast. So verse 1, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision, much in every way? Verse 9 says... What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. So whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, whether you've had a religious upbringing or something completely away from religion, if you like, there is no advantage when you come to God this morning. We come as we are, and the Lord wants to receive us and bless us today. No advantage in being a Jew... And secondly, is there any value in circumcision? Well, circ male circumcision under the law for God's people set them apart, and God commanded it of them. But the way in which the people failed was that they may have had an outward sign in that sense, but what God was looking for, he said, was a circumcision of the heart. So in other words, it's all very fine and dandy for people to go through rituals, and people do go through rituals today, don't they? You, you, you can find people come to church, and, and their hearts are actually a long way from the Lord. They don't really know him, but they think they're good because they're keeping up some kind of religious activity. And, and you know, I'm good to my neighbor, and I don't break the law, but none of these things are ever going to be good enough for God. We cannot be righteous by outward signs. What the Lord wants to see, he wanted to see it in the Jewish people, and he wants to see it now today in us, is really the circumcision of the heart. That is our love, 
our devotion, our worship. We can put on the outward appearance here this morning, can't we? It's easy for us to do that. What are we like in our own personal lives? What are we like in the world in which God has placed us? Then the third argument uh, and the third question that Paul puts is this. And this is very much like a, a legal argument. Will people's unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? So the, the argument really is this. God is always true to his promises. He is always faithful. He said to the Jewish people, if you keep your side of the covenant, I will bless you. You will live long in the land that I've given you. Um, you will know me. You will be blessed by me. You'll be provided for by me. Um, but he also said, if you don't, then, then this is a conditional promise now, because if you don't keep your part of the bargain, then you can experience trouble and trial and distress um, where you live. And God is always true to his promise. Now, I am so glad that we live today in this, what we call sometimes a day of grace. In other words, we look back now at what Christ has done upon the cross. Because we're not governed by the same covenant, by the same law. By the law in the Old Testament, if we failed, we were always falling short of God. Under Christ and what he has done upon the cross, when we know him as our Lord and Savior, there is an unconditional promise that God will keep us for eternity. So, for example, uh, God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Uh, for example, uh, we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We've been born again of the Holy Spirit. He is our guarantee uh, of eternal life. And there are just so many verses that give us that assurance. Now, as Christians, those of us, I guess most of us here this morning, would already say, well, we trust in Jesus that does not give us a, a kind of a carte blanche excuse, does it? To wander away from him and, and to do as we please. In fact, I suggest if we really love the Lord and really know him, then when we're away from fellowship with him, our hearts are never happy or content. And the Lord draws us back. And if that's not true, have we actually really genuinely come to a repentance of our faith and a, tr a repentance of our sin and a personal faith in the living God. There's one verse I love very much, 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, well, sometimes we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. He's promised always to be with us, never to forsake us, and he will always be true to his promise. And then the fourth question is this. Is God unjust in bringing his wrath on us? In other words, do people say it's not right that God should judge us? Well, of course the answer to the question is absolutely not. He is the sovereign creator. He determines what is right. And sometimes we question and we don't understand uh, the ways of God. His ways are beyond us, beyond our understanding, says the scripture. But he is far wiser and just as well as loving. I'm thinking again of uh, Jeremiah and the time when, Jer when God told Jeremiah to go to the potter's house. And he saw the potter forming out of the clay a pot. Have any of you ever done pottery? Uh, I have to say, yeah, one or two. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. My only attempt uh, was in a kind of a mug, which did get glazed eventually. But it was all kind of wonky, and the handle just about held on. Uh, it was fit only for pens and pencils, and then I think I threw it away eventually. But the potter had the ability to make something beautiful and useful. In the following chapter, uh, Jeremiah had to observe a pot being, or he had to get a pot and then smash it. And those were important lessons. 
what God wanted to do in his people and what he wants to do in us. We're just like the clay. He is the potter. I think that's a verse in Isaiah. Um, are we allowing God to form us into something both beautiful and useful for him? That's often been my prayer in my life. And it's a great thing, isn't it, to be beautiful in our worship and our love of the Lord and then useful in his service. He is not unjust in bringing his wrath on people. And then the the next question, if I increase my wrongdoing, does this enhance God's glory? Now, you've got to see the lawyer here in the court of law, haven't you? And he's bringing out these questions and putting them up to show the the hollowness of the argument. So um, if if somehow, um, I was thinking of an illustration of this. Um, say you wanted to repaint um, your lounge and you get to halfway up and say, do you know, I think I'm going to leave it there, a few brush strokes up there, because look, if I just leave it as it is and it just gets worse and worse, look how the bottom half looks now in contrast. It's wonderful, isn't it, what I've just decorated compared to the top half. Well, you wouldn't do that, would you? Well, you might do if you're into modern art, but, you know, you wouldn't do half a job, would you? Or, or almost like a criminal, this probably isn't a good illustration, who says, look, I'll commit more and more burglaries because then when I get caught, uh, the police will have what a wonderful record in solving crime because they'll be able to get me for so many of them. I mean, you just don't go there, do you? So the measure of our wrongdoing isn't an excuse for wrongdoing to enhance God's glory. The reality is, when you look at the Lord and compare with us, what a contrast there there is. We have not loved the Lord our God with all our soul, mind, and strength. We have not always loved our neighbor as ourselves. We've not put the Lord first. This is naturally uh, where we are in life, compared to the beauty, the glory, the holiness of God. Says verse 8, why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil, that good may result. Their condemnation is just. So you've got all of these questions in that section which uh, are answered and, and they're not down by the Apostle Paul in this argument. And so we come to uh, the verdict in verses 9 to 18. Uh, These aren't uh, verbatim quotes from the Old Testament, but if you were looking at your Bible, you can tell that quite a lot is coming out of the Old Testament. And there are quotes there from Ecclesiastes, Psalms, and Isaiah. Now, these things likely will get people's goat. Uh, So if if I... This will get your goat, okay? I'll warn you in advance, okay? You're not righteous, you don't understand, you don't even seek God. You've turned away, you've become worthless, you don't do good, not one of you. Your feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark your ways. The way of peace you do not know. There is no fear of God in your eyes. Now if you go out on, I I can say that reasonably confident, you're not going to lynch me this morning. Because most of us have had to come that way of recognizing that in God's sight we are unworthy sinners. And that's the most important foundation that we need to have. Um, Ruth and I have recently been concerned that some people who you know, are part of church actually appear to have no grasp in a sense or able to verbalize what it is by way of faith that they have and how they became Christians. And it is a a real concern. And this is why I think these chapters in Romans are so important for us today. They don't make make exciting preaching or listening to, do they? They're not the kind of thing you walk away and say, I'm tremendously lifted by all I've heard about my condemnation. But they are establishing an important foundation if we realize that we are falling short of God and his glory, and then we come as sinners to Christ, 
we then can repent of sin and we can know his salvation and forgiveness. And if that is true, and for most of us already that is true, then we rejoice and we give God the glory. And what a transformation in our lives. Let us understand then the, the pure and holy nature of God. No sin or evil can be in his sight. And um, if people who reject him, as Adam and Eve did, find that we have this endemic characteristic uh, of a sinful nature. Not all of those bad things that I've just read out will be true for everyone, maybe. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Some people say, well, that's not true of me. But all of us have fallen short of God. Says verse 12, now we, sorry, 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. God who is our creator, who has become our redeemer, who is sovereign over the world, makes his declaration. And in that sense, people of the world should be silent and listen to what God says and prepare to humble themselves before him. Now, I, I like this translation of Hebrews 3 verse 20, the New Living Translation. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. It's a bit like the children's story earlier. However good, however strong, however bright, however good we are in life, we could never be good enough for God. But you won't find, and I trust you won't find, uh, Christians here who are weighed down by their sin or complaining at God because by his grace we've been set free and today we have sin forgiven and we are at peace with God. Well, may God help us to really grapple and grasp his word. Not the easiest message to take on board, is it? But if yet you do not know Christ as Savior, will you acknowledge before him that we're not good enough, we failed, we fall short, but thankfully Christ has paid for that sin upon the cross, and in him we have salvation. Let's pray. Father, we commit this word to you this morning. Lord, we just acknowledge that before you we do stand condemned in our sin, but we say hallelujah, praise the Lord for our Savior who has borne in his body upon the cross our guilt, our shame, our condemnation, and now is victoriously sat at your right hand preparing a place for all who love him. May it be true of each one here that we bow the knee to him acknowledging him as Lord and Savior of our lives, and therefore rejoice daily at our forgiveness of sin, that we're at peace with God, and we have that certain knowledge of eternal life. To you, O Lord, we give all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a song together. It really follows on beautifully from what we've been thinking. Only by grace can we stand. It's only the grace, undeserved merit of God that we can stand. Let's stand and sing only by grace.
Um, well, it's very much into the presence of the Lord that we're coming again now, and we're going to spend a few moments in uh, gathering around the table of the Lord as we break bread, as we have communion together in remembrance and worship of Him. And I'm going to read a few verses which are found in Ephesians 2. Perhaps you'd like to listen to them. Hebrews 2, verse 11. They follow in really from our message and focus in upon Jesus on the cross. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. That's where we were, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, one, that's the Jews and the Gentiles, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create himself one new humanity or one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. This is the word of God. Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. We reflect today upon the Lord who has made possible our salvation. He is the one true and living way. And what a cost he paid for our redemption. We'll spend a couple of quiet moments just reflecting upon that and then we'll come together to break bread and drink of the cup. If anyone else would like just to pray uh, a word of thanks and praise, an opportunity to do it now. Father, as we come once again this morning to the very cross of Christ, we see that place where truth and holiness, where love, grace and justice met. Father, we are so unworthy, but he is worthy to receive all praise and honor and glory. Lord, we just acknowledge our sinfulness but our hearts and our minds are focused upon our Savior who was willing to be obedient even to death and that the death on the cross. Thank you that he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he knew that to bear away our sin, God had to have uh, his will 
exercised in being separated from his son and for him to bear away the sin of the world. Saviour, Lord, we thank you for the cost that you paid, for the love that you showed. And we say with another, Lord, we love you because you first of all loved us. Thank you for the cross this morning. Thank you for the price you paid. And we glory now in your power and resurrected life. And we do uh, this this morning as we're reminded in the scriptures, as often as we take of this bread and drink of this cup, we do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we're looking forward to Christ's return. And in this table this morning, we look back, but we also look forward and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, we'll um, take of the bread and eat it as we receive it. And uh, then we'll hold on to the cup and drink together later. Thank you, Lord, that we've been redeemed, not with even the corruptible things of this life, even like gold or silver, but we've been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And we take of this cup uh, as representing the shed blood of our Savior. And Lord, we offer to you our praise and thanks in his name. Amen. Amen. So let's just retain the cup and then we'll drink together. In accordance with the Lord's word, then let's take of the cup in a loving and affectionate memory of him. Amen. Well, let's sing a, a lovely song as we uh, close this morning. 
and uh, it reminds us again of our Redeemer. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. Let's stand and sing. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 God bless you.